Thanks, Emma. Wow. Um, what a session to start us off with on, on our three-day venture here um, with the Sustainability of Canadian Agriculture Conference. Um, next, we move to a panel, a panel of three experts um, brought from around the world and within Canada and in various um, um, components of the topic of achieving net zero. Um, Firstly, I wanted to just point out there was um, a QR code there for scanning um, and getting CCA, CEU credits. So, and that's going to be reappearing for different sessions in the course of the three days. So please um, uh, capture those points if you need them, those credits. And please in the chat, you can write uh, your questions. What we're going to, we have three speakers and the speakers are going to have 20 minutes each. And then we're going to move to a panel discussion. Okay. And the panel discussion uh, is your opportunity for us to look at the chat window and pose the questions to our three experts. Uh, I'm also seeing a note here that there will be some kind of a primate, a male chimp. Uh, will be sent out um, uh, with all QR codes. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but somehow on your screen, look for uh, a message about MailChimp or something that looks monkeyish, I guess. So uh, moving on, our first uh, speaker um, is uh, Anne um, Moe uh, from um, the FAO, the Livestock Development Officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Now, Anne will, um, her title of her talk is Achieving Net Zero with Livestock Production, What is Possible? Looking forward to your talk, Anne, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And please let me know if- Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, good. I'm gonna go full screen. Um, and, and thank you very much for, for inviting me, from, for having me today. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit late on my side. I'm, I'm based in Rome, uh, in Italy. Um, uh, and I would like to thank uh, Tim McAllister also for this invitation. We've been working together on greenhouse gas emission from livestock and I enjoyed your, your talk very much, Tim. Um, so, so uh, and, 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 and before we start, I just want to point out, we are seeing the slide panels, but not the presentation modes. You must have it on. There we go. Boom. That should be better now. Thank, thank you, Mario. Um, so what I prepared for, for, for this talk, um, a global view on, on greenhouse gas in my stock uh, and the net zero discussion. It's, it's a very trendy discussion at the moment. And from the perspective of the FAO, uh, as we may know, we're working for eradicating hunger and malnutrition in the world. Uh, and this, this topic is also a, a, a very hot one for us. And, and I, I prepared some um, some evidence and also some, some uh, uh, elements from the work we're doing with different countries. So before, before entering into the net zero discussion, um, I'd like to propose a different way of looking at emissions. So we all committed to uh, achieve the Paris Agreement. Uh, a lot of countries signed up for this. Um, and we could look at it uh, in this way. We have a limited budget of CO2 uh, to spend, okay? So what do we get from a ton of CO2 equivalent emitted when we compare and other uh, economic sectors uh, and, for example, the industry or services? So on the very uh, left side of this slide, uh, looking at money, uh, how much money, how much uh, value do we get from uh, spending a ton of CO2 equivalent in agriculture uh, versus different uh, sectors? And you see, it's not a lot of value you get from agriculture at global level. Obviously, if we look at high income countries, you, you, you may have a different pictures from low and middle income countries. But basically, if you want to make money, don't spend your carbon in agriculture. 
But on the, on the second chart, you see that you get twice as many jobs if you invest this carbon in agriculture compared to other sectors. Uh, and this is, again, a global average. Uh, you, you might have differences between uh, high income countries and low and middle income countries. And then if we move to the right hand side of this of this slide, uh, looking at, for example, kilocalories. So in terms of, of food energy, um, we have very limited food coming from the industry sector, not, not based on soil at the moment. Uh, so most of our kilocalorie culture. Uh, and if we move to, to nutrition and for example, macronutrients like protein, um, you see also uh, the share of the livestock sector in terms of contribution per ton of CO2. So this is just to place the debate in terms of, well, we, we, we do have some decisions to make and there are trade-offs and what do we want to uh, achieve with the carbon, the limited carbon budget we have? Uh, but the question could be asked in another way, in terms of individuals, if we if we are not policymakers anymore, but we're individuals, what do we get uh, from our food choices? So we all uh, used to this chart on the on, on the slide at the moment, uh, the ranking of different foods in terms of greenhouse gas emissions per 100 gram of food. So you see very limited emissions for 100 gram of carrots, of potatoes, of banana, and very high emissions for 100 gram of chicken, pork, cheese, or beef. Just a, uh, a disclaimer here, the, these figures are coming from a study uh, from 2014 that was based on, on uh, particular systems. In, I just indicated here in red the average uh, we have in terms of emissions per 100 gram of food for, uh, in this case, Western Europe to compare with Denmark. Um, and in an average, we, we have lower emissions. It really depends on the system you consider. Um, but then what we also know is that uh, animal source food are very dense in terms of nutrition. And here in the middle, you see the percentage of uh, nutritional recommendations met for 100 gram of products multiplied by the number of nutrients for which we meet those recommendations. Uh, so that's a, a nutrient density index. And you see that in this case, animal source food rank among the highest one. So all in all, what we, really, what we should really compare uh, when we look at food and our food choices as individuals is the nutrition we get from uh, 100 grams of CO2 equivalent spend or a ton of CO2 equivalent spend like we looked at for um, uh, global budget uh, in the previous slide. So in that case, you see we have a drinking and again, uh, um, you know, if we considered averages for uh, for Europe, we would even have a, another uh, different ranking again. So, so I think I think it's important to look at um, emissions for our choices based on the nutrition we get, and this is really really at the core of our work uh, now in FAO. So, so what I'm trying to do here is really to build the business case for what we call rather low carbon livestock rather than net zero, but we'll, we'll get back to this. Uh, first, because livestock is a climate solution. Um, livestock uh, is, has a very large potential for mitigation for reducing emissions and carbon sequestration. Uh, also, because we know there's a very short term positive impact on climate and global warming from reducing methane emissions in particular, uh, because it's a short lived climate pollutant with a very high global warming potential. So every uh, every molecule of methane that we uh, spare at the moment may have a, a cooling effect on, on the climate. It's a very, very important and timely uh, mitigation action, but also because, and, and this is coming from, from our position in FAO, a large share of most vulnerable people to climate change and, and poor livestock keepers, for, for, for which improved practices can also build resilience, not only about reducing emissions, but it's also about making them more productive and also less vulnerable to climate change. But the, the, the second point is, is it really a choice? Some emissions are really unavoidable. Uh, livestock are still key to food security and nutrition for a very large share of the global population that don't consume in on, enough animal source food and uh, for which demand is growing and, and they should consume more. But also because this is a key element of their livelihoods. Uh, for example, we know we have more than 400 million of poor livestock keepers for whom uh, livestock production is really at the core of their livelihoods. So moving on to um, what's being done. Uh, and how to align with the Paris Agreement. Um, what we work with is really what countries declare they want to do in their, what we call 
and contributions, the NDCs. Um, and NDCs were recently updated in 2021 uh, for the COP in Glasgow, uh, the Climate COP in Glasgow. And you see here uh, the place of livestock management in the updated NDCs uh, for countries that consider livestock as a mitigation adaptation measure in dark blue, only an adaptation measure in light blue, or in yellow, a mitigation measure. Uh, and you see, you see, it's first not all countries consider livestock, but also all countries don't consider livestock in the same way in terms of climate solution. Uh, a very interesting uh, analysis of the NDCs uh, that was done by the CCAPS program of the CGR centers. If we look into those NDCs in more details, uh, so on the left you have the previous NDCs before the revision, so more countries uh, did provided an NDC than uh, in 2021. You see a, a bit more than uh, 140 countries in total uh, with the revision. And then the first block is, is livestock as an adaptation measure, and, uh, the type of measures that are included. Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, countries that include livestock as a mitigation measure. So only a third of countries that provided an NDC do consider livestock as a mitigation measure. Uh, and you see the breakdown, 18 countries of, 80% of countries uh, looking into manure management, 16% looking into feed management, civil pastoralism, 10%, and only 5% of the countries that declared, that, that put forward with uh, an NDC include specific mitigation targets uh, with livestock. So it's, it's, it's actually um, very low in terms of what countries committed to. Just a few examples, uh, you, you're probably familiar with the Canadian uh, NDC, uh, but looking at uh, uh, another type of countries, here we have six countries from, from the Sahel where uh, I've been working uh, recently. Um, and you see the type of, of commitments they have, and they usually divide their commitments into unconditional and conditional. So unconditional means we commit to achieve that whatever the resources are made available to us on our own resources. And conditional means if we have access to climate finance. Um, and you see that um, we, we do have some interesting commitments in terms of reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions compared to a business as usual situation. So it means that those countries commit, for example, in the case of Burkina Faso, to reducing their emissions by 30% compared to uh, emissions uh, without any interventions in 2013, not compared to today, but compared to what emissions would have been in a situation without uh, any commitment. And this is very important because a lot of countries uh, in the world do commit to reductions compared uh, to a business as usual. And you see the contribution of uh, the agriculture, forestry and other land use sector on the right hand side. Uh, not every country uh, includes uh, agriculture and specifically livestock, as we saw, uh, but uh, there is a contribution in most countries of, of this sector. So what, what is common from, from our perspective in, in, in most of these NDCs, the, the six ones I, I, I just uh, presented, but in, in more general terms, what countries commit, um, is that there is a need for financing to reduce emission but also very specifically for capacity building and technology transfer, especially for um, measurement, reporting and verification. How do we measure the, the, the emissions that we are avoiding? How do we measure the emissions that, we're not, that are not taking place because maybe we're compensating with sequestration and so on? This is a very critical point. Um, and also what we see from, from most of, of what countries commit is that there's hardly any consideration for the co-benefits of improving livestock production. The, the, the just very basic improvement in terms of uh, livestock production techniques, practices, is usually not considered as having climate co-benefits. While actually livestock represent the larger share of agricultural emissions in most of these countries where we're working. Um, livestock measures focus mainly on, on adaptation, for example, pastures, pastoral infrastructures, and so on. But what, what, so, so looking at the, looking back at the net zero, what, what's, what's feasible? So we propose in FAO three main strategies for reducing livestock emissions. Uh, the first one is improving animal and herd productivity and efficiency. The second one, increasing soil carbon sinks. And the third one, reducing waste and recycling and the place of livestock in the circular bioeconomy. 
um, there, there is a, there are actually uh, two other big strategies. One being what we call end of the pipe solutions. But I think uh, Tim did a very good job presenting them in terms of uh, um, reducing directly methane emissions from enteric fermentation uh, or reducing emissions from manure management. Uh, the, this is a whole uh, other uh, categories of reducing emissions that uh, is is mostly relevant for uh, higher income countries. And the, the last one is, well, the potential of, of, of demand side measures and, and the role of consumption uh, and trend in consumptions in, in, in the change of emissions. Uh, but really those ones, uh, the three ones on the screen are the ones we're working with. So just as an example on improving efficiency in production um, and, and again, making that uh, this comparison with what is feasible in terms of cutting down on meat production, the demand side measures. There's a very um, interesting recent paper from 2021 looking at the key role of production efficiency changes in livestock methane emissions by comparison with demand side efforts. Uh, and this paper concludes that the potential is higher on the efficiency side. And you see on the left hand side, um, the, the type of, of uh, global assessments that we can have in different production systems and, and regions, uh, looking, for example, at small remnant uh, production in West Africa, where improvement in feed quality, grazing management, and health and husbandry can emission by 27 to 41% and uh, productivity by 19 to 40% depending on uh, adoption rates and and um, uh, and being on a conservative or more ambitious uh, scenario. Uh, in the same analysis, we looked at mixed dairy uh, production in OECD countries where it was more looking at end of the pipe solutions, as I explained before, lipid supplementation, anaerobic digestion and energy use efficiency, and all these options were very well described by Tim, uh, where the potential uh, measured for these systems was between 14 and 17 percent reduction compared to baseline emissions. Um, another big area, as I said, was soil carbon sequestration. Um, it's not easy to have a global estimate of the reduction potential. There are several figures still available at the moment. Uh, the science is, is building up on this. We have more and more uh, evidence, uh, but it's really, really uh, depending on management practices, um, the permanent or not of those management practices, whether they're reversible or not. Uh, and the quantification is still very challenging, challenging, uh, especially, as I said, uh, you know, looking at short term versus long term uh, sequestration. Uh, so this is an area that has a very large potential, but it varies very much uh, depending on the management practices and the type of source uh, and the type of, of, um, of interventions that we consider. And the last area, the improved integration of livestock in the circular bioeconomy. Um, this has to do with the type of feed uh, that uh, are used in, in the global livestock uh, sector. So uh, just a reminder here with this pie chart of what is the actual feed basket of uh, the global livestock sector uh, and the very important uh, share of what we call non-edible feed material like grass leaves, but also uh, crop residues and, and byproducts that are still not edible to, uh, to humans and uh, quite limited shares of, of of edible materials like grains. Um, but the, the, the whole idea here is that there's a potential for uh, improving the share of non-edible, so reducing the feed food competition, uh, and therefore kind of closing um, the, the, the supply chains and closing the, 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 the non-circular non bioeconomy at the moment, making it more circular by using more waste as animal feed. Very interesting papers, I just put one here uh, uh, in, 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 in terms of what is the potential of using more, for example, swill or, or uh, byproducts, co-products from the agri-food industries as animal feed and the potential for reducing emissions from such interventions. It also has to do a lot with uh, a better uh, recycling of energy uh, and, and nutrients from manure, uh, but we, we heard a lot about this already, and, 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 but it's, it's very important to know that at the moment, uh, in, the, in a lot of places, in a lot of systems of the world, we're still wasting a lot of, of these resources uh, and it could be improved through better manure management. Just a few examples, uh, making it a bit more specific. Here in the case of, of for example, of Senegal, 
um, you have a, a list of, of, of uh, interventions of, uh, I would say, uh, um, improved practices. Uh, I'm sorry, it's in French, uh, but I'm sure some of you do speak French. Uh, and you have an, uh, in orange the reduction in terms of emission intensity for methane and take methane, and in blue uh, the uh, change in in uh, in production that is resulting from. Uh, from, from the same interventions. For example, uh, looking at, at uh, fodder banks, uh, good reduction in emissions and 20% and improvements in production, uh, improving animal health, vaccination, uh, improving animal genetic resources. Uh, and, and you see all this list of, of different systems in agro-pastoral and pastoral systems uh, that have uh, a very uh, significant impact on both emissions and, and production. Similar study in, in beef production in Argentina. Uh, so on the again, you have reduction in enteric methane, and on the right hand side you have uh, the percentage change in production. And you have a list here from strategic supplementation of steers, uh, mating season, reduction of reproductive diseases, supplementation of breeding cows, use of uh, some uh, specific forage, uh, and so on. You see, you see the, the 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 biggest potential is actually on on feed and forage, um, and you have also some uh, significant potential in terms of herd management. Uh, for example, reduction of reproductive diseases uh, in the middle, you see a uh, very interesting impact on, on emissions and productivity here. Um, so, so in terms of what we're doing for this, we're really uh, trying to support um, the better accounting of uh, the climate co-benefits of livestock investments. For example, here in support of, of IFAD, we looked at a, a project in Lesotho where we quantified that uh, the very basic uh, improvements in productivity uh, would have a, a very uh, significant in in impact in terms of total emission, absolute emission, minus 7%, 30% uh, reduction in emission intensity, plus 40% in protein production, and minus 3% in feed intake in terms of dry matter. So this is also part of the work we're doing in, in FAO. Um, another example, going back to those countries uh, that I mentioned before in terms of the NDCs, the six alien countries in Western Africa, uh, this is a very large World Bank project looking into pastoralism, so about half a billion dollar invested in these six countries for in support of pastoralist systems, uh, and what we estimated is actually overall, including emissions reduction from uh, the livestock themselves, uh, and a little bit of sequestration in improved range and management, we had a project net balance of minus 1.2%. So we do have, uh, to some extent, uh, not even a bit better than the net zero uh, balance in this case. Um, so just an example on how um, what is needed for investments uh, in low carbon livestock. Uh, I think what we all know at the moment at this at this stage is that we do need tier two IPCC tier two level calculation and unfortunately this is still not the case. Only 63 countries use tier two, including 42 developed countries and 21 developing countries. So we still need to uh, make a lot of efforts in in moving forward in terms of of um, calculation of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and because this contributes to the Paris Agreement, uh, but also uh, the Coronavirus Joint Work on Agriculture, and we can, uh, we, we, this is what we're trying to do with FAO, improving uh, how country reports uh, on their emissions and how they commit to improving um, their, uh, their inventories. So to conclude, um, as, as a wrap-up, uh, I think what, what is interesting from our point of view is that um, in terms of investment in livestock, uh, environmental safeguards vary from one financing institution to another, for example, in terms of World Bank or if a lot of countries, those, those investments are really the ones that are uh, implementing uh, the national livestock uh, global pol uh, national policies. Uh, but the need for carbon footprint is really becoming more and more of a standard. So uh, any livestock investment now needs to show they have a, a co-benefits in terms of a livestock.
uh, I already mentioned IPCC tier two calculation, uh, but uh, to, to look back with, with the analysis of the indices, a lot of technical support is needed to show the climate co-benefits of livestock investments, uh, vaccination campaigns, photo production, animal genetic resources, all this can have a, a climate co-benefit and, and we still need to improve uh, the, the technical knowledge uh, to be able to report that. And just an example, uh, I'm, I'm, if, if you haven't heard about this, there's a very large new green climate fund investment in dairy production in East Africa that is actually entitled Pathways to Dairy Net Zero, promoting low carbon and climate resilient livestock in East Africa, led by support of FAO. Uh, and I think a really interesting turning point in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, the, the climate finance uh, that is finally considering livestock as, as a, a possibility. And I will stop here. Thank you. Great, Anne. Thank you very much uh, for that world perspective on uh, livestock and moving to net zero. Um, we'll um, be able to, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and discussion about the complexity of that in our um, discussion section.